Hello and welcome to this programme from Bailey Gifford. My name is Gavin Lumsden, I'm from CityWire and I'm going to be talking to Matt Brett, manager of Bailey Gifford Japan Trust. This is a good time to speak to Matt with Japan's stock market having recently hit a record high and the economy moving out of a long period of deflation. Good afternoon to you. Hi Gavin. Right, nice to see you. Um, thanks for making the time. Um, as I said, I've got some questions for you, so I'll just kick off straight away with, um, you know, as I alluded to, Japan's stock market and economy have been in the news a lot lately. Uh, the Nikkei 225 index surpassed its December uh, 1989 peak in February, um, but the low point was way back in 2009. So I wonder what makes Japan still attractive after a long, if intermittent, recovery? Yes, I think you're right. That 1989 peak has been a, a bit of a psychological hurdle uh, on the minds of the Japanese for the past now 35 years. And I think it's probably a good thing to see that in, in the rear view mirror now. And you're also right that the Japanese market bottomed quite a number of years ago now and has been making uh, good progress since that time. And I think what makes Japan exciting for us is the number of interesting growth companies within the market. Uh, particularly in the medium and the, the smaller area of the market. And these have often been overlooked, uh, in our view, by global investors over the recent years, given that you know, Japan perhaps hasn't been centre of, of people's attention. But there's been a lot of exciting companies doing, doing solid progress over the years. And I think that that's what really makes us still excited about the prospects looking forward, even despite the fact that, you know, uh, you know, we're 15 years from that, that bottom in the Japanese market. Exactly. And on the economic front, what's the, could you tell us what's the significance of Japan uh, exiting uh, from deflation? Um, the Bank of Japan has just about ended negative interest rates and, and, and uh, yield control, curve control policies. What does all that mean for investors? Yes, yeah, so I think this is a very interesting uh, change. Um, Japan's really gone through a period, you know, post that bubble era, era it had a period of, of deflation, uh, and that was very difficult for Japan. And then more recently, it had this period of kind of noflation with neither really inflation nor deflation. And more recently, we seem to actually have inflation in Japan again. You know, we're seeing property prices increasing. We're seeing wages going up. We're seeing prices of consumer goods rising in Japan. So it's quite a broad based inflation, you know, not anything to be concerned about, but certainly a healthy level of inflation. And I think the, the Bank of Japan moving away from the negative interest rate policy and taking those baby steps towards normalizing the interest rates is just really a reflection of where the Japanese economy is getting to, which is it's no longer really in those special measures of the past. It's behaving a lot more normally. And I think for investors, I think what is exciting is that, you know, deflation is a difficult environment uh, for uh, investment. You know, it, it really weighs on things. It makes it very difficult to, to achieve returns. And I think that that ending of that, you know, is, is helpful for, for a number of companies. And combined with your earlier comment about, you know, the Japanese market getting past that 1989 peak, I think there's, there's a real potential here for the what the Japanese would describe as the animal spirits, you know, to continue from here, you know, that, that those things now, those problems of the post bubble era, they, they really do feel like distant memory in Japan now. And I think hopefully what we can focus on are the individual companies and what they're able to achieve in the future. OK, well, talking of companies, uh, it's good to see the, the, the Japanese stock market uh, doing better. But why are large companies seem to benefit the most from the recent rally? Yes, that's right. Um, so recently, you know, a lot of the, the good performing stocks have been the large export companies, you know, driven by the weak yen environment and also some of the large banks as people have started to, to worry less about inflation. And so, you know, shareholders in the trust have had quite a disappointing period of relative returns, albeit, uh, you know, generally prices have been increasing because basically we haven't been able to keep up with those exporters, uh, you know, driven by the, the strong cyclical background uh, globally and the, the weak yen environment. OK, and then, uh, you know, given that, what, what, can you explain why the trust, why you've sque skewed the trust, the portfolio, uh, a bit more towards smaller and medium sized stocks? Well, essentially, this is a long term strategy that we've employed for, for many years, you know, and, and it doesn't work clearly every year or every few years. But 
what, what the reason fundamentally for being more interested in the medium and the smaller companies is we think ultimately that's where you have the, the greater growth potential, uh, particularly when we think about the domestic economy of Japan, albeit it's recovered again. But the population of Japan is pretty static. It's a very wealthy country. So in order to find a growth company, you really need a company that's a medium company that can take share uh, within the market over time. And that pulls us towards uh, some of the, the domestic internet companies and things like that. Um, and those companies naturally are the ones that are, are medium and smaller companies. And on the other hand, uh, when we look at the index as a whole, some of the big areas we're just not super excited about. Uh, you know, when we look at those mega banks in Japan, you know, they're perfectly solid, uh, but we don't see particular growth prospects there. And when we look at, for example, the big car companies in Japan, you know, we, we really struggle to see how there's going to be much growth in the type of vehicles that they are selling, given the increased competition uh, coming in the battery electric vehicle market, both from Tesla uh, and also from the Chinese competition. So some of those big areas within the large cap area, we just structurally uh, don't, don't find particularly attractive. Now, that's not to say that they can't go up quite a lot for a year or two, but in the long run, you know, we're much more excited about, about those small and medium sized companies as a whole. OK, it, it, it's been a difficult couple of years for your sort of quality growth uh, uh, approach. Um, just wondering how, how cheap are, are, are these stocks at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, there's lots of different metrics that, that one can look at. But I think what, what is striking is it doesn't seem to us that you pay much premium at all for growth at the moment in Japan. So, for example, you know, just looking at the, the Bloomberg analysis of the Japan Trust portfolio, it suggests that uh, the portfolio is only on a price to sales of 1.1 times, uh, which seems remarkably low to me for a growth portfolio. And I think, you know, when we look at the earnings of some of those companies, particularly the car companies, they've done very well recently, buoyed by the weak yen. But if we start to think about adjusting those for the cycle, uh, some of those companies actually look quite expensive now to us uh, relative to, to the more genuine growth types of businesses. Um, so that's, that's a, a good position from which to, to, to go from, hopefully. Um, your long term themes remain uh, digitize, digitalization, automation and, and artificial intelligence. Uh, can you update us on, on each of these and, and, and give us some examples of key stocks, please? Yeah, so I think this is uh, this this increased use of, of technology is something that we're seeing across the whole world. But I think it's been accelerated at the moment you know, by the developments in these large language AI models. And also, in many cases, Japan uh, is coming, particularly in the Internet space, from a place that's not quite so advanced as in the West. And so we've got you know, companies at an earlier stage of development. So, for example, uh, looking at that Internet area, you know, a couple of the companies we're really excited about at the moment include GA Technologies, uh, which does online real estate sales, uh, and also Bengoshi.com, which is a, a, a forum for lawyers. Um, and they've also uh, developed a kind of document signing business, a bit like DocuSign. You know, so these companies are, you know, still relatively small within the context of real estate or within the context of the legal system in Japan. But we believe they've got good competitive positions and a lot of growth ahead of them. And then in automation, uh, you know, I think we all know Japan has a very good reputation uh, within robotics. Uh, you know, we've got the classic uh, strong Japanese robotics company, FANUC, within the portfolio. But also, for example, we've got within machining centers, DMG Mori, uh, which merged a, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, uh, with its German competitor, Gildermeister, to create an overwhelming number one globally in that area. And that's managed to get the margins up and that, that's been doing well. And broadly speaking, we're super excited about the prospects for automation. Because what we're seeing is the potential uh, for AI and machine vision to make robots a lot smarter than they have been in the past. And a big opportunity for FANUC is cobots, uh, which are robots that work alongside humans uh, and are capable of stopping moving you know, if they come across a human, etc. And machine vision and knowledge of the environment makes those robots an awful lot better. Uh, and we think there could be good growth potential there. And in terms of AI, I think this is one of these kind of mega themes, a bit like the internet, which 
is going to going to uh, cover a whole host of different companies. But for example, within this portfolio, long-standing holdings like Rakuten uh, and CyberAgent, uh, both of these companies have huge uh, numbers of customers, and that gives them access to lots of data, which is really what you need to feed these AI models with to create differentiated services and product offerings. And talking to uh, the, the president of LY Corporation, formerly known as Yahoo Japan, they're talking about getting efficiency gains of about 50% uh, on software engineers, uh, software developers, basically. And these gains are, are absolutely massive. And in a country that, that maybe doesn't have quite as many uh, software experts as some countries, I think this is going to be a huge benefit for Japan as a whole. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Um, let's turn to SoftBank, which um, is your biggest holding and has been a bright spot lately. Um, it surprised the market with better than expected annual results in February. Um, perhaps that wasn't a surprise to you, but yeah, what are the, I just wonder, what are the prospects for Arm Holding, its, its biggest investment, uh, as well as the rest of the portfolio? Yes, uh, SoftBank's one of these companies where I think lots of people, if you read the, the papers, you know, you'd imagine SoftBank has been a pretty disastrous company, but quietly behind the scenes, Mr. Son has been having some good successes. And the most recent one is, is Arm, uh, where you know, he bought this uh, from the UK market uh, in the wake of Brexit. And you know, at the time people said, you know, maybe he's paid too much for it, et cetera. You know. uh, anyway, he's recently relisted it on the NASDAQ, you know, making three or so times his money on that company. Uh, which is is quite good for for a few years' work, and I think the real excitement with ARM is it's got a kind of monopoly on the architecture of mobile phone chips, and those chips are going into more and more types of of devices, uh, and are very important, you know, in terms of of AI. You know, having more powerful uh, architecture within mobile phones. So it seems to be one of these rare businesses that has a very dominant position in what it does and good growth prospects ahead of it. And I think that's been better recognized now. But looking beyond that, you know, SoftBank has some other quite exciting investments. For example, it has a stake in ByteDance, which is the, the owner of TikTok, uh, a company which continues to, to grow very fast and, and, and have a lot of excitement. And they also seem to be working very hard at the moment on developing autonomous driving systems. Uh, you know, combining that, that, that chip type of knowledge and also the AI type of knowledge. It looks like they're trying to get cars to be able to drive themselves in a, in a more almost human-like fashion uh, than, than the current uh, autonomous driving efforts. And if they can pull that off, that, that would be very exciting. So I think, you know, my, my broad joke with uh, SoftBank, you know, is, you know, if we could all fail as well as Mr. Son, we'd be doing quite well because you know, there is always this gap between the news and the reality. And the reality is there's Mr. Son again has got the company into some very exciting uh, places and, and actually those uh, profits are starting to come through again. Okay, good to hear there's a, a turnaround going on there. Um, the trust benefited from a, a private uh, equity bid um, at a big premium for uh, the, uh, outsourcing uh, the staff company recently. Uh, has M&A uh, mergers and acquisitions been, been a theme evident elsewhere? Yeah, so there's, there's various bits of, of M&A happening in Japan. And I think the old perception is that Japan's a very difficult market to do m and in. But I think that's really changed over the years. You know, and we see, for example, yeah, this private equity bid for, for outsourcing. But we've also seen uh, private equity bids for some of the, the holdings within Shin Nippon, the, the smaller company investment trust. And we've also seen kind of more restructuring type of m and So, for example, uh, the holding in Rome, uh, you know, is part of a consortium basically uh, restructuring uh, Toshiba, uh, which is very exciting as well. So I think, you know, that, that aspect of Japan and, and restructuring things, I think, has been quite helpful. And I think almost the, the odd thing is that as Japanese companies are getting a bit more confident again, they're almost a bit more prepared to take some of these more tricky decisions, uh, you know, to restructure or do M&A to try and, you know, improve the, the competitive position. And perhaps they were, you know, during the darker days of the, the, the last 30 years, when maybe they were more focused on, you know, staying alive rather than, than, than looking forward. But that's very much in the past now. 
Absolutely. OK, I'm interested to know um, which stocks you picked when you were reinvesting those gains from outsourcing. Because um, you, you also made some um, money on uh, uh, Itoshu, uh, a trading company that you sold after a, a share price re-rating. Yeah, what, what did you do with the, the, the cash from those two uh, sales? Yeah, so in general, you know, look, we have a very, very low turnover style, you know, annual turnover you know, is typically in the low teens. So, you know, very much what we're doing is buying the companies that, that we think have the good growth prospects and then holding them for the long term. You know, in the case of Itochu, you know, one of the big general trading companies, we've held it for many years. But the reality is the shares have done incredibly well. And, you know, Mr. Buffett has, has uh, nicely advertised the benefits of the trading companies, but you know, they're over double the price generally of where he was buying as well. So, you know, we think they've pretty much done as, as much as they can. And in terms of reinvesting, it's gone into a variety of different things, but some examples would be Sato, uh, which does barcodes, which fit really, really nicely. Barcodes and RFID chips fit really nicely with the whole AI theme in terms of labeling up things uh, so that computers can understand which packages are going where, lots of uh, potential in the food industry, uh, also the medical industry. Also more into GA Technologies, the real estate, uh, online real estate company I mentioned earlier. And finally, some into OISIX, uh, which does uh, meal uh, kit delivery services and has recently acquired a competitor to give it much greater scale. So I think you know each of those companies are probably not, not exactly household names, you know, but these are medium-sized companies that we think have, have very strong growth prospects ahead of them. How, how is China's weak economic recovery affecting Japan? Um, the delayed return of uh, Chinese tourists affected stocks such as Shiseido and P Polar Orbis, um, half-year results recently showed. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, during COVID, we invested in a few different things that, that had been having a difficult time through lack of demand. Some of those have worked already. So, for example, Bridgestone and tyres, you know, that, that's worked pretty straightforwardly. People started driving again and flying again. It does plane tyres as well. And, and, you know, the profits have, have recovered. But those skincare companies have been slow to recover. And a good part of that is the, the, the Chinese consumer hasn't really got going yet as, as fast as, as, for example, the Americans have. And I think, you know, looking forward, I don't think we have... Uh, great concerns here. We think it's just a matter of, of timing. Uh, you know, the competitive positions of those cosmetics companies uh, remains very strong in China. But what we're, we're really waiting for is for the Chinese consumer to get fully back onto the front foot. And I think basically what we've seen is that there's been a bit of a lag in Asia uh, compared with the West in terms of getting through COVID and mentally as well, just getting really back onto the front foot. And I think, you know, Japan seems to be about six months behind the UK uh, in terms of reopening and things like that. And China seems to be six months behind uh, Japan. And, you know, one of my colleagues is literally uh, just back uh, from visiting China, um, gone to check out some of the, the competitors to our companies, etc. Um, you know, and the report is that, you know, things seem to now be picking up in China, uh, which is, I think, quite encouraging. But in the long run, you know, when we look at the spend that the Chinese uh, have on skincare, you know, it's still a fraction of the amount that the Japanese are spending in this area or even the South Koreans are spending. So what we think is that these skincare companies, uh, you know, have this huge long term growth opportunity ahead of them. You know, we're happy to be patient and just wait for that, that recovery to, to keep coming through. OK, um, let's turn to, to gearing or the trust's ability to, to, to borrow. Um, gearing stood at 19% uh, in February. Um, how does that compare with the past? And, and what does it say about your confidence uh, in the trust's investments? Yeah, I mean, the gearing over the years has ranged from kind of about where it is now, you know, high teens uh, down to, to kind of, about 10% or so, you know, so we're at the more optimistic end at the moment. And gearing is really a call on the absolute uh, potential performance of the stocks that we invest in. Um, you know, and in that sense, you know, we still feel really optimistic because, you know, going back to, to your opening comments, you know, although the Japanese stock market as a whole has done really well, many of our companies haven't done especially well yet. And we still see a lot of opportunity for them. 
And that's why we've got the gearing, you know, towards the upper end of the, the range at the moment. And, you know, we, we wouldn't take it actively, you know, over 20%. Uh, you know, so we're pretty much, you know, at the, the maximum level of gearing at the moment. And that just reflects the enthusiasm we, we have for the portfolio. OK. And um, meanwhile, um, the, the trust shares trade at a relatively wide discount of 12 percent. The board's been buying back shares, uh, which is good, um, about three and a half percent in the last uh, half year. Um, yeah. Again, what, are the, what message does do those stock repurchases convey to investors? Well, look, I mean, stock repurchases at a discount, you know, increase the NAV per share for all remaining shareholders. So hopefully they, they're seen as a good thing by, by all the shareholders. Um, and three and a half percent of the company bought back in six months. Uh, you know, it's equivalent to, to seven percent in the full year if we keep going at the current rate. So I think, you know, these are more than tokenistic types of buybacks. You know, it's it's really you know, actively making a decision that that discount does look wide, uh, you know, and the board is prepared to, to buy back. And also the, the Japan Trust doesn't invest in any unlisted companies. There's not so many bigger unlisted companies in the Japanese market. So, you know, it's very easy for, for us to buy back and maintain the shape of the portfolio exactly how, how we'd want it to be. Um, so, yes, um, you know, I think there's no change to the, to the board's fundamental thinking. It's interesting you, when you put the uh, that three and a half percent on an annual basis, obviously at seven percent, that's getting towards the level of uh, obviously you know, your um, a Scottish mortgage, um, Bailey Gifford's big global trust uh, announced a big share buyback of, of, of a similar sort of magnitude actually. Yes, I think, I think they are similar. If anything, it might, might even be the case that the, the Japan Trust over the past six months is, is going at a slightly faster run rate. But obviously, you know, the Japan Trust is a very much smaller uh, trust than Scottish mortgage. So you know, the absolute amounts are, are, are much smaller. But yes, in terms of buybacks, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a serious amount of buyback. OK, thanks, Matt. Well, as a proportion, it's, it's showing some conviction in the, in the, in the buybacks. Um, let's turn. That's all the questions for me for now. But uh, let's turn to our audience's questions. And um, I'll start with one that we got just before the programme started. So I'm going to uh, it's a good question, but I'm going to ask it so I don't forget it. Um, but it's, it's about the about the dividend policy, which we, we, which we haven't touched on and linking it to corporate governance uh, changes in, in, in Japan. But the question is, yeah, Japan's trust performance mirrors that of most Bailey Gifford trusts. What I'd like to know, um, says the investor, is how the regulatory changes in Japan encourage, among other things, increased payouts to shareholders. Um, yeah, Bailey Gifford has, over the years, made a big thing of its trust not paying a decent level of dividends, being growth funds. However, it's periods such as the last couple of years where being paid while one waits for capital returns is helpful. So, um, yeah, there's an investor appreciating the, the, the dividends. But, yeah, what is, your, what is the trust dividend policy at the moment? Yeah, so, so essentially there's two parts to this. You know, there's the dividends coming into the, the trust from the underlying holdings, and then there's, there's how the, the, the company itself treats the dividends. So in terms of the dividends coming in, you know, we have seen quite a rapid increase in companies paying out more than they used to. And you know, this is part of a, a long-standing journey. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not totally ancient, but when I started doing Japan, you know, you'd meet companies and they'd say our dividend policy is 50 yen. And you say, why 50 yen? And it, it was just 50 yen. You know, it, it had no relation whatsoever to, to the earnings or the balance sheet or anything. It was just 50 yen. And now, you know, we went through a period of focusing on payout ratios. And now, you know, with the governance code and the stewardship code, companies are increasingly, uh, you know, thinking about the, the balance sheet as a whole and how much is appropriate to pay out. And that journey has continued. And obviously, although it's not the main focus of, of this trust, you know, the side effect is, you know, more dividends being paid out even by the growth companies. And most internet companies in Japan, most companies indeed, uh, pay dividends, uh, which is quite different to, to, to many growth companies globally. And, and the trust has got that income coming in. So, you know, over the past few years, you know, there's been quite a dramatic increase in the dividend being paid out by the trust uh, because, you know, to start with, it had accumulated uh, revenue deficit, and that was paid off first. And so the trust first paid a dividend of under one pence a share uh, back in 2018. 
And then the dividend since then has gone three and a half pence, four and a half pence, six pence, nine pence, and last uh, year, 10 pence. Uh, so the yield on the trust at the moment is about 1.3%, um, which, you know, the focus remains very much on the, the capital growth. You know, we're not trying to, to run a particularly progressive type of dividend policy, but it just happens that those dividends have been increasing strongly from the underlying holdings. And then the trust, uh, the, the board has been, you know, paying out the, the, the minimum dividend rounded so far. Uh, and that's been the outcome. Now, the one thing I should also note is that, of course, all the income is in yen. Uh, so, you know, the, the dividend as paid out in sterling, you know, you could see variability on that because of the effects of the currency. But I think, you know, it just really reflects the, 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 the dividends that are coming in. And when dividends come into an investment trust, the vast majority of them are automatically paid out to maintain the investment trust status. Um, and that, that's what we've seen in the past few years. And looking forward, I don't see any sign that the company's enthusiasm uh, for, for paying out dividends is diminishing. And the other thing is, is you're also getting quite significant buybacks uh, from many Japanese companies. And you don't have much options issuance in Japan. Uh, you know, so often we, we've got dividends coming in and growing on a shrinking uh, share count uh, for many of the businesses. Which, in the end, you know, should be should be quite helpful to, to the shareholders of the Japan Trust. Okay, and um, actually, the question about the you mentioned the currency, which can be quite volatile and affect uh, investor returns, as you just said. Do, do, what do you? How do you manage the, the currency side of things? Do you do you hedge uh, it at all? So basically, we run the trust entirely uh, effectively in yen. So um, we don't do any hedging. Uh, it's an unhedged vehicle, and. Uh, the board has considered in the distant past hedging, but decided not to not to consider doing it. Um, and the loans that the trust has for the gearing uh, are all uh, in yen, so they don't create any currency exposure either. So, you know, where there are borrowings, they're being borrowed in yen. All the investments are in yen, but obviously there's a translation effect back into sterling in terms of the the reported uh, results. And there's a translation effect in terms of, of dividends, uh, you know, the amount being paid in sterling is obviously dependent on both the amount coming in in yen uh, and then also the, the, the exchange rate. OK, thank you. I, I've got a question about um, the revenue returns, which I think you know, might link with dividends, but um, maybe with the currency as well. But a question from an investor who's, who notes that the, the, the revenue return per share rose strongly from 2017 to last year, uh, but then fell back. Uh, they wondered what has been driving that. I think there's two effects here. There's a bit of a currency effect going on with the weakening yen and then being translated back into to sterling, um, which is which is what what you will see within the accounts. Um, and also, you know, as it's been a very difficult environment for growth companies in Japan. We've been slightly leaning the portfolio towards some of those smaller, higher growth companies, and they're often coming with a slightly lower dividend yield. So what we're aiming for here, you know, is for total returns. Uh, you know, and if we see more opportunity within something that yields a bit less, then we'll happily sell the higher yielding company in order to buy uh, the, the lower yielding one. But nonetheless, you know, the overall trend, I think, is still you know, positive in terms of what Japanese companies as a whole are doing with dividends. OK, um, there's uh, a viewer who um, wants to ask you about yeah, the state of the Japanese stock market and you know, how it seems to be quite uh, polarised. Um, so the question is, how do you look, two questions, how do you look at growth versus value in Japan? And, uh, and an observation that activism seems likely to last many years and, and, is, and, is, is, and it seems to be doing well. Um, so we yeah, have view on growth versus value currently, and also whether you get involved with uh, any kind of activism or uh, engagement. Yeah, so in terms of that, that growth versus value thing, it's definitely been the case that, you know, the past kind of two, three years, it's very much been a time for the, the, the value type of investor in Japan. You know, and we've suffered relatively as a, as a consequence of that. You know, we talked about some of the reasons earlier, you know, that strong global cyclical recovery combined with a weak yen is a, is a perfect environment for, you know, businesses that maybe don't normally have terribly high margins 
uh, but you know it really helps them along a bit you know and then in terms of of the opportunities you know i think what we've seen is in share price terms many of our favorite companies have kind of gone sideways or down for two or three years but under the bonnet you know they've still often been growing their sales growing the earnings so they've basically just been becoming cheaper and when we look forward you know we can't really get so excited uh, about some of those uh, you know let's say you know cheap but but not really fast growing companies and yes when some of these companies you know traded at a big discount to the book value or something like that you know undoubtedly there was there was some kind of value in them and and that value maybe has now been realized but looking forward they're still the same companies as they were before and um, they're not likely to have a, a high growth rate ahead of them and therefore you know, we don't find them so exciting and i think on this activism thing it, it's an interesting question and, and it appears to be a separate question, but in some ways it might actually be the same thing because I think many of the, the activists have been targeting these uh, more value type of companies. And as a result, you know, it appears there's been very good returns from activism in Japan. But of course it may be there's been very good returns from value stocks in Japan and uh, activists have tended to be in those value stocks. So of course there are cases where the activism will have encouraged things or moved them along a bit faster. But I think there's also an element here to which the returns achieved by activism may have been somewhat flattered in the past two or three years by the fundamental nature of the companies that they're investing in. Now, when it comes to us, I mean, you know, generally speaking, we invest in companies with management that, that we like, uh, you know, and generally we're backing the management. There are occasions, you know, when we have made observations, you know, with regard to the balance sheet conservatism, uh, you know, maybe, you know, we, we should think a bit about that, et cetera. But in general, you know, we're more at the supportive uh, end of shareholders, um, you know, and, and we're trying really to encourage companies to, to be bold enough to, to seize the growth opportunities ahead of them rather than to be focused so much on the, the dividends and the buybacks and so on. Uh, but there are occasions you know, when, we, when we do engage with companies. But you know, I think the, the main point here is that when we're looking at, at the companies that, that we invest in, many of them have a founder shareholder, uh, which gives us natural alignment. And you know, they want to make money themselves. We want them to make money. We want to make money together. You know, and I think in the long run, that's probably a more reliable method of, of making money rather than kind of agitating, you know, for, for shorter term change. Understood. Um, I question here about what lessons may have been learnt from you know, reviewing the performance difficulties of the past few years. You know, has style and diversification of portfolio been reviewed, reviewed um, during this period or as a result of this period? Yeah, I mean, we've certainly looked at, at how we could have done better, um, you know, and with some of the, the aspects, like, for example, thinking about, you know, cars and, and banks doing very, very well. You know, we don't worry too much about that because, you know, I think it's it's not naturally what, what our main focus is. But one area that we have picked up on, you know, is we did sell out of uh, some companies like Advantest uh, and Disco. Uh, Advantest does memory testers and Disco slices up wafers. Now, these companies have come very much into the focus in the last year or so uh, with that AI boom. Uh, you know, and looking back, you know, we were perhaps too hasty to, to, to exit those companies. Now, the reason we did is because we saw even more opportunity in some of the internet, uh, more software type of businesses from AI. But certainly, had we not done that, you know, the returns, you know, would have been better. And I think that's something that, that you know, is, is a learning point. Uh, whether we're going to improve things by getting back into those stocks at this stage, you know, I, I think that's a, you know, a very open question. You know, I'm not, not convinced about it. But certainly that, that's something that we would acknowledge as being something that we could have done better uh, in the past few years. But a lot of these things, you know, a lot of these things, you, know, you have these quite big swings in, in performance. And, you know, ironically, you know, we, we were getting a bit of challenge, you know, a couple of years ago about, you know, are we growthy enough? You know, and, and I think with the benefit of hindsight, I think we can see we were more than growthy enough, uh, you know, and if anything, perhaps a bit too growthy. But at the same time, 
growth seems very much on sale at the moment. And that's why, you know, at the margin, you know, we're pushing the trust, you know, further down the market cap spectrum a little bit and pushing it into these higher growth names, you know, more than before and selling some of these names that maybe we feel things like Itochu, nothing wrong with Itochu, but we feel it's it's largely done its stuff and there isn't as much opportunity there. So effectively, we're running at the moment with a slightly purer version uh, of, of our natural style uh, than perhaps we had, you know, five years ago. Uh, you know, and that, that's been undoubtedly a, a rough ride uh, in the past couple of years. But in the long run, you know, if these companies can continue to, to show progress and, you know, we've seen progress with SoftBank, with, with its arm listing, and we've seen progress with Rakuten, the second biggest holding, uh, getting more subscribers into its mobile business. So we're seeing operational progress for the individual companies. And I think, you know, that gives us a lot of comfort that, you know, over a longer time period, you know, these companies' share prices will gain more traction. OK, that's great. Actually, uh, the link, linked question uh, here, um, viewer would, would like you to uh, you break out the difference between the large uh, and mid caps in the portfolio. What's the, what's the allocation? And then a uh, follow on question, uh, because it does seem to be more skewed toward mid caps at the moment. Is there an overlap with uh, the ship and the pond, uh, smaller companies trust? Yeah. So, you know, it's not that we don't invest in any large caps, certainly, but, you know, we just have a, a lower weighting there. Uh, you know, as we spoke about earlier, you know, being a growth investor, I think that that's quite natural when you look at, you know, what the big companies in Japan are. But for example, you know, as of the half year, you know, the, the topics 100, the, you know, the equivalent of the FTSE 100, you know, that was 66% of the, the, the market uh, cap of Japan as a whole, uh, whereas it was 42% of, of, of your company, of the Japan Trust. So, in that sense, you know, we're structurally, you know, quite a bit underweight, those those very uh, biggest companies. Um, and sorry, there was a second part. Ah, the overlap with Shin Nippon. Uh, so there is some overlap with Shin Nippon, and it's been pushing up a little bit, but it is a pretty modest overlap between the two. So we're talking, uh, you know, low teens type of percent at the most overlap. And the reason for that is because Shin Nippon really specializes in these, you know, you know, really quite small companies, you know, whereas the Japan Trust is is more a kind of, it's got a mid and, and small cap bias, but it's certainly by no means a, a pure a small cap trust. And companies, for example, like SoftBank, you know, are among the, the bigger companies in Japan. So I think Japan Trust has a, has a broad remit. You know, there's nothing to stop us investing in larger cap companies. What stops us doing it isn't their size, it's their, their growth prospects, which often seem to us quite dull. While we're talking, we're making those kind of comparisons, um, another question uh, asking how similar is the Bailey Gifford, the Japan Trust, to the open-ended Bailey Gifford Japan Fund that you, that you also run? Yeah, so basically the, the overlap between the Japanese Fund and the Japan Trust is more of the order of two-thirds overlap. So there is much more similarity between the Japanese Fund, the open-ended vehicle, uh, and the Japan Trust than there is between Japan Trust and Shin Nippon. Um, you know, the difference is mainly in those small and mid cap stocks where, you know, Praveen uh, who manages Shin Nippon is the deputy manager of the Japan Trust. And, you know, it can and does go further down the market cap spectrum than the Japanese fund does. And that gives us access to, you know, a few more of those, those, those smaller types of companies. You know, the Japanese fund tends to go down to a market cap, you know, very roughly of about 100 billion yen. Uh, so we're talking here, you know, depending on where the currency is, you know, I would have said uh, in the past, you know, something uh, near to, to, to a billion dollars. Uh, but now, you know, it's a bit smaller than that, whereas the Japan Trust can go down significantly uh, smaller than that. OK, uh, two more questions I think we've got time for. Um, and the first of those is going to be, yeah, we were talking about gearing earlier on. You're explaining um, your approach to using borrowing. But um, yeah, the, uh, the question is, given the market over the past few years, um, wouldn't it have been sensible to reduce gearing? Yeah, I, and I can totally get where that question is coming from. Here we are cheerily talking about the market being at an all time high. Uh, and, and here we are with maximum gearing, you know, and, and it's a very logical question. 
I think though, when we look at the portfolio that we have, we have substantially lagged that overall market. So most of our stocks are not at all time highs. And therefore, you know, we feel quite confident, uh, you know, in thinking that it's the right thing to use the gearing. And going back to that, that dividend point, I mean, the cost of borrowing in Japan remains incredibly low. Uh, you know, so, so we're getting in kind of more income in many cases from the companies we're buying than we're paying out uh, on, on, the, on the loans. And I think, you know, that gives us, yeah, quite a degree of, of conviction here. OK, uh, brilliant. And so the last question is, I mean, again, given the difficult few years, um, looking ahead, though, you've expressed your conviction in the, in the growth stocks you've got. Um, but, you know, it's an inevitable question, really, from, a, from an investor. What is going to improve the performance over the benchmark uh, in the next few years? Well, I think at the end of the day, what, what I would expect to improve performance versus the benchmark is how those individual companies do. So, you know, when I look into the benchmark, you know, I see you know, those big car companies often with, with earnings that are hitting all time highs in the case of Toyota Motor. But as I look forward, you know, five to 10 years, I see loads of competition coming, you know, from those Chinese battery electric vehicle makers, from Tesla. I see potentially it being a very difficult environment for, for Toyota going forward. Uh, whereas many of the companies that we invest in, you know, those internet type of businesses, those factory automation type of businesses, et cetera, I see as continuing to be able to grow their sales and profits over time. And it's an old adage about in the short term, the market's a, a voting machine and in the long term, it's a weighing machine. But I think, you know, the type of situation that, that will help us is if those sales and, and, and earnings keep coming through for our companies, and you start to see some of those, you know, more value type of companies, you know, struggling to grow their sales and their profits. I think that's when you'll start to see the differential in, in share price performance. But look, telling exactly when things go well or badly is a really difficult thing. Uh, you know, who would have known during COVID, for example, that the Bailey Gifford portfolios would turn out to be quite a, a good place to, to have your money. If you'd asked me in advance, there's a a global pandemic coming, uh, will it be good or bad? You know, I, I think it would have been a brave thing to say that it would be a good thing uh, for the portfolio, but actually it turned out that it was. And similarly, you know, we are in a situation now where you know, we have already seen a, quite a big global recovery uh, coming out of COVID. We've seen this burst of inflation, which has been you know, difficult and confusing for people and it's probably weighed on the, the prospects of growth companies. But we've also seen, you know, digitalization and AI continue to develop. And I think, you know, in terms of the companies we have, we think many of them remain, you know, very strongly positioned for the future. And therefore, you know, my conviction comes from, from being able to take a longer, a longer view on things and, you know, expecting that, that in time, you know, those companies that, that grow their sales and their, their profits will become better rewarded by the market. But in the meantime, you know, we have to be patient and, I guess, uh, keep going with the buybacks, etc. cetera, for, for the time being. OK, Matt. Well, thanks very much for your time. Um, let's hope the, uh, the re-rating uh, follows the, uh, the, the, the progress in innovation that you've been, been talking about. I hope that what you've heard has provided some helpful insight into the Japan Trust and where it invests. But in the meantime, from me, thank you very much and goodbye.